name is Gabriel Cousins. I'm a holistic physician. I'm also a uh, licensed homeopathic physician in the state of Arizona. I'm a psychiatrist and family therapist. I also use the modalities of uh, not only homeopathy but Ayurveda and meditation. I've been teaching meditation since 1973 um, as well as natural healing and some elements of Chinese medicine in my overall holistic practice. Um, I'm 57 years old and I've been doing live food since 1983. I wrote my first book on live foods, The Spiritual Nutrition in the Rainbow Diet, in 1987. And my next uh, major book was called Conscious Eating, which just came out, it started in 1990, but also uh, revised edition with five new chapters having to do with the biologically altered brain, the biologically addicted brain, nutri uh, super nutrition for pregnancy, and how to individualize your diet to maximize your vegetarian uh, diet lifestyle. The biologically altered brain I've actually I've mentioned in two of my books. One is called Depression Free for Life and my new edition of Conscious Eating. They complement each other because in terms of live foods, but really in a, I would say, a broader perspective, what I see in our society as a psychiatrist, a family therapist, and a holistic physician is that there's a consistent degeneration that's happening with each generation. And I feel it's the, because of that degeneration, the brains of people are beginning to, in a sense, become biologically altered. Um, and I see it in a, as an epidemic. There's like 40 million people who are depressed. There's 8 million children who are given Ritalin. Up to 10% of the child population now is, is, on, is diagnosed as hyperactive. We have 50 million alcoholics. We have people who are taking in this country 5 billion tranquilizers a year. As many as 10 million people are taking marijuana each week. 2.2 million people are taking cocaine. Something is out of balance. And instead of saying, oh, it's just kind of a psychosocial problem, I try to look deeper into the question. And that question has taken me to the work of Price and Pottinger and their studies, uh, where they took uh, Dr. Pottinger, did a, a 10 year cat study. He had 900 cats, and this is from 1932 approximately to 1942, divided them in two groups. In one group, he gave totally live foods to, and the other group he either gave cooked milk or cooked meat to. The cats that were given the live food for the duration of the study were very healthy cats. They had no changes in their mental state as measured by their purring, by consistent behaviors, by their lack of violence and viciousness and, and uh, scratching, biting, and so forth. They gave birth to ho homogeneous uh, litters, uh, they didn't have trouble with allergies, they didn't have problems with uh, light, uh, lice and mites and different things like that, and they were generally, consistently very healthy. Okay. The second group, who were given the cooked food, in each successive generation there was a breakdown in the quality of health. And that breakdown included um, the immune system beginning to go, so the, by, by the third generation, 100% of the cats had allergies. Um, they had mental changes. They, were, uh, they didn't purr anymore, they were violent, they scratched, they bit, their behaviors were irregular. On the physical plane, they actually had a um, change in the bone structure. In the first generation of these cats, they had about 17% calcium in the bones. By the third generation, the bones were like rubber, and they had only 1.5% calcium. It's a big jump. The, uh, on the physical plane also, they had heart disease, they had nearsightedness, farsightedness, malocclusion of the jaw, they had physical changes uh, in these areas here, palate changes, um, they had a w significantly weakened immune system, they had consistent infections in the, in the bladder, the kidneys, uh, the adrenals, 
um, they were not able to reproduce after the third generation and many of the cats immune system was so weak that they died six months after uh, they were born in the third generation. Now this lack of fertility is something that began to increase with each generation um, and also the amount of spontaneous abortions. There were 25 percent spontaneous abortions in the cats in the first generation who were on the cooked food and up to 70 percent uh, by the uh, second generation. So we have a, a significant degeneration in the system. Now what's really important here is some of this really mirrors what we're seeing today. We have people with chronic fatigue, which is the immune system. We have environmental allergies. We have a, a significant amount of hypothyroidism happening in the population, just like the cats. Okay? We have infertility going on uh, in 1980. Uh, of the 30 million couples with a woman of childbearing age less than 30 years old, 44% of them were infertile. It was a very big statement. In 1965 through 76, they did studies and they found that the amount of infertile cu couples under a certain age um, jumped from 480,000 to 920,000 in an 11 per year period. So what we're seeing is this breakdown in the generations. The principle that's very powerful here is with each succeeding generation on a uniformly poor diet, you have a successive degeneration with each generation. And now we are seeing the culmination of that since the 30s when we started to move to the industrialized food, the white flour and the white sugar and the canned food and the processed food and the pesticide and herbicide food. We're seeing that and it's, and it's being mirrored in the 8 million kids on Ritalin, three quarters of a million kids on Prozac and Prozac-like drugs, uh, up to 12 to 15 million people on Prozac or Prozac-like drugs, on Prozac, I mean, um, where we have over 60 million prescriptions for Prozac a year now, as of 1998. Major epidemic. 40 million people depressed. This is not some kind of accident, and I'm linking it to this degeneration with each generation of poor diet, whereas the cats and the live food did not degenerate. They maintained their health through five generations. The good news is some of this was reversible. In the Pottinger cat study, uh, by the second generation there was an improvement in the immune system. By the third generation, many of the allergies had gone away. The bone structure began to uh, reassert itself into its normal matrix, uh, and the, a lot of the uh, organ and glandular problems seemed to fade out. So by the fourth generation of cats put on a live food diet after they've been on a cooked food diet, you have the emergence of a healthy cat again. It does take time, it can happen. Um, they also found that when cats were put on a cooked food diet for 12 to 18 months, they were never able to have a fully healthy litter. So we see that in a relatively short time, this kind of problem pops up, you know, of this degeneration. Now that's one set of studies that makes or raises the alarm bell. Another set of study was done by Dr. Price, who knew and worked with actually Dr. Pottinger, and Dr. Price studied 14 different cultures indigenous cultures, and he studied them all around the world, Aborigines, um, Maori tribesmen in New Zealand, Native Americans in, in Canada and U.S., people in Peru, and what they studied was the time when these cultures began to take on the Western diet, the industrialized, I use the word industrialized, fast food, junk food, processed food diet, and he found like the cat studies, that almost immediately a degeneration began to set in. Bone changes, structural changes in the palate and the, and the, the upper jaw and lower jaw, changes in the chest, changes in the hips. The nutrition was one-half to one-sixth of their original indigenous diet. 
there was definitely a drop in the immune system and, and to the extent that a greater incidence of, of dental caries as well as TB. And they found that with each generation, again, there's an increase in spontaneous abortions and congenital defects. And the mothers that had the most pregnancies tended to have more Down syndrome at the fifth and sixth pregnancy down the line. What is that saying to us? That the germ plasma of the parents had become weakened by the poor diet. And with progressive pregnancies, the germ plasma and uh, nutritional quality of the mother became weakened. They did not see this in the people who were on the indigenous diet. Now where do I get the word biologically altered brain, which is my word, a term I use both in my book Conscious Eating and also Depression Free for Life. When I got the word, the, my, this term came to me because I saw that they were linking, particularly Dr. Price, was linking mental changes in the people. Now we said mental changes in the cats also happen, but it's more significant in the uh, uh, human studies. Uh, they found that when there was congenital defects like cleft palate, and there was a variety of studies on that because that was easy to study, they found up to 80% of the people with the cleft palate tended to be, uh, had 80% of the people were psychotic, had cleft palate, um, 80% of what they would term in those days mental defective. And I don't know exactly what that term means, but I'm, I'm, I think it obviously means some level of much lower IQ. Uh, increased amount of epileptic uh, seizure disorders. All those were much, much higher in the groups that had the congenital defects. Now we take one more step there and we start linking congenital defects to poor diet or poor germ plasma, which is the sperm and ova we begin to see a pattern. It's the same pattern we saw on the cats. Degeneration of mental state, degeneration of physical health. In the same way in the 14 different cultures we have degeneration of mental state and degeneration of physical health. They also studied um, juvenile delinquents and they went to the Cleveland uh, Pre-Juvenile Hall and they studied the structures, uh, Dr. Price did, of their, of their facial structures. And he concluded that 98.5% of the children in the juvenile hall had these, ment uh, had these physical structural changes. And they also had lower, on the average, had lower IQs. So they're honing in on something, that the brain somehow mirrors the, what we call the congenital defects that are showing up in society as a result of the poor diet. And that's where we make that extrapolation into what I call the biologically altered brain. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it means it's a brain in which the pleasure centers are not working as well as a normal brain. Now, that sounds like a nice, interesting theory, the pleasure centers in the brain. But in 1990, Drs. Noble and Bloom actually discovered a genetic defect. And they found that in 69% of alcoholics very high percentage, um, there was a defect in the dopamine uh, pleasure center system where they, people had about one-third less uh, dopamine receptor centers in the brain, which means that it was much harder for them to have pleasure and feel good. That's how that translates on a basic level. There's a sort of angst or discomfort. When people drink alcohol, do drugs, are addicted to sex and um, food addictions. It starts. That's their way of handling that lack of pleasure center. They they hyperstimulate, and there we then make the connection between the biologically altered brain and depression, because a lot of people get depressed when their their brain is not that they know my brain is biologically altered, but what they know is they don't feel good. Okay. That's where we're talking about epidemics, 40 million people. Not just I had a bad day at work. Okay, We talk about the high degree of a drug addiction and the 5 billion tranquilizers a year that are taken in the United States. And we talk about the epidemic of hyperactivity. And so part of my work is to say there is an alternative 
to what I call better living by, through chemistry, which has never really worked. And what I mean by that is, hey, if somebody's got a little bit of hyperactivity, just toss some Ritalin at them. Somebody who's a little depressed, don't deal with your depression, don't try to change your lifestyle so your physiology improves, just toss a little Prozac at them. And what they aren't understanding is that not only does not not work, but things like Prozac and uh, Ritalin and amphetamines, which preceded that, and cocaine, which preceded that, which were all things that have been used to make people feel better, um, actually cause brain damage. And now that's being documented. What we see that when the Prozac and Prozac-like drugs, what's happening is that the brain down-regulates because it's got too much serotonin, so that the uh, neurotransmitter receptors actually start to disappear. And the amount of serotonin that's being produced is less because it's being overstimulated by these drugs because it's not a natural approach. And my work is, is hopefully helping people withdraw giving them the natural support with the appropriate neurotransmitter amino acid precursors, the proper vitamins and minerals, the um, making sure they get enough fatty acids in their diet for brain function, making sure they have a diet that balances their pH, because each depression is kind of individual, and then ultimately what I call the lover's electron diet and way of life, where you eat and live in a way that enhances the endorphins, and the neurotransmitters. So to me, it's a much bigger statement, and this is one reason I feel that live foods is very, very important for our society, and we're just waking up to it. But still, people want to choose better living through chemistry, even though it means they're willing to dull their minds and, and slow their physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual growth, because they're not dealing with their life and not raising it to a higher level of health and vitality. The Lover's Electron Diet and Way of Life says, hey, you eat live foods, and you are going to enhance your pleasure centers. And my work, my gift I'm, I'm, at this point I'm, I'm offering to society is to say, wait, we have an option to better living through chemistry. And that option is to choose health and vitality with the Lover's Electron Diet and Way of Life, where we can actually heal the hyperactivity and heal the biologically altered brain that causes depression, hyperactivity, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and other addictions. And that to me is really exciting. And live food is very much a corner of that. And to me the choice to what I call the unfelt life, because these other things are to make us go to unfeeling. Uh, to, uh, the, the Socrates once said the um, unexamined life is not worth living. I say the unfelt life is eating like eating cardboard soup when we're given the nectar of the divine. So really important choices in our society. Who we are, what has meaning and value in our life. Do we go for the quick fix, which incidentally uh, doesn't give us really the quick fix. It gives us the illusion of the quick fix. Do we go for illusionary personalities? Do we go for not only illusionary personality, but high risk of side effects, three times higher rate of suicidability that you get on Prozac and Prozac-like drugs? Or do we go to something that builds our foundation so we can grow as full physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual beings? And so this is a really important choice that we in our society have to make. We want to keep breaking it down and, and having more and more epidemics of depression and drugs and, and hyperactivity or do we really want to try to correct it? And so my focus is can, we need to correct it at the very base level. What we take into our, our, our bodies affects our minds, our spirit, our thoughts, and the very nature of the expansion of our consciousness. And this is the theme in, in conscious eating. It made more specific with, in my book, Depression Free for Life. Well, my experience is and the reason I set up the Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center in Patagonia, Arizona, which is on 166 acres in, in the mountains up there in southern Arizona, is that people need to experience it. For a lot of people, the transition is the hardest part of it because it's new territory. People often call me, they're post-drug use, post-alcohol, or they you know, have depression, and they'll come 
I need a few days to really develop a full program. I'll see them for a few hours, like three hours, and try to decide what kind of diet they should be on, a higher protein diet, if they're a fast oxidizer or a lower protein diet, high complex carbohydrate, that kind of thing. And then I'd like them to experience the lifestyle. So we have a variety of programs over a period. And I, to me, the transition takes about two years to be really successful and be done in a peaceful way. Okay, where it's one step at a time. In my book, Conscious Eating, I talk about the transition as you give up, let go of beef, and then chicken, and then fish, and eggs, and then dairy. And, and, and this happens over progression until we finally get to a certain percentage of raw, and then we're increasing that raw and organic food, because organic is very much part of it. So I have workshops. We have a thing called Arizona Live, where people come for a weekend experience to get a feeling for it. We do uh, spiritual uh, juice fasting experiences, which is the most powerful and most effective way I've seen for people making their transition because they really can get the feeling, the wonderful ecstatic feeling of what it means to have a body where the energy moves freely f through, where we can become superconductors of the divine energy. It just happens for a lot of people that way and it's like a delightful surprise. Then I have uh, courses for the mind, what I call Zero Point, and we also have a food preparation courses. Uh, we have a, a delightful 14-day um, cuisine, and we have different international live food dishes in each day, so people are exposed to a full range of that. And so we're now actually offering a certification in that program for people. So people then get to say, wow, this is fun. And then we also teach Tri Yoga, and we teach, which is... Uh, a, a dynamic flowing yoga which incorporate, incorporates uh, breath and meditation. Um, we have people walking in nature so they begin to reconnect. Part of the lover's life trying to die in the way of life is really connecting to the rhythm of who we are. So we begin to see ourselves as sacred and everyone else around us is sacred and also the planet. So we begin to work and help people shift more and more to a healthy lifestyle. And my experience that, that the people who are most successful go through a process of about two years, one gentle step at a time, so they succeed with each step and then they take the next step. Now if somebody has, uh, and I don't specialize in cancer, but somebody's working on cancer, they're seeing an oncologist, they want to get the diet part, they may need to make that transition quite quickly, or they'll make another kind of transition. But I'm talking about the regular person that's got different kinds of things like chronic fatigue or depression. It's a process that needs to happen gently. People move too fast, they can get really out of balance because the live food diet has a lot of dynamic energy and people need to build up their ability to handle the, that energy and power. So that's how I see it. And that's why I set up our, our training and our experiences so people come for the fast, they come for this training, that training, uh, 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 training in, in sacred relationships. Different things that get them there to be part of that. And, and relationships are our important part of, they're not a required part, but they're an important part of living this love of electron day and way of life. Because that's a diet and way of life in which you are in love with yourself and other people and the whole planet. And it encourages that sense of well-being. But we also know in terms of health, vitality, longevity, that being in relationship is important. Uh, two out of five people who are married are happy. One out of four single person is happy. And one out of seven divorced person is, is happy. So the statistics are there. And we also know that spiritual life is part of it. And we emphasize spiritual life. Not just doing a few ceremonies, but whatever your path is, getting deeper into it. They found that people who are on some sort of spiritual path, doesn't matter what it is, are twice as happy as people who aren't. And those are like studies that have been done. I emphasize exercise as part of it. And you don't have to be at an Olympic workout to do this. You just have to do um, maybe walk three or four times a week for a half hour, 45 minutes, and it gives you 90% of Olympic exercise and has definitely an antidepressant effect, but in a sense, an endorphin effect and a sense of well-being effect. Adequate sleep is important. Open your heart to others, being in as a loving relationships. Also, 
um, touch, some kind of touch in your life is important. Um, and even sexual activity, not even, sexual activity, they just, there was research done in 1997 in, in England where they found that men who, who had orgasm twice a week actually had half the mortality as people, who, as men who didn't. That's a, that's a big statement. That's men from ages 45 to 60. And we also know that it adds years to women's life, too, to have adequate and, and healthy sexuality. So these are all pieces that we have to look at, you know, in terms of the overall picture of what I call the lover's electron diet and way of life. In my book, uh, Spiritual Nutrition, the Rainbow Diet, specifically talks about color as a, as a key to what foods are best for you. But there's another piece to it, and that's to understand that nutrition isn't just food, but it has to do with condensation of the cosmic energy, whether it's from direct energy coming into us, tachyon energy coming into us, um, sunlight, breath. And the most condensed form of this light energy is food. And as that, it is light energy, it is the vibration of the photon energy from the sun and the different rays of that photon energy. So different foods are gathering in different rays, different parts of that spectrum, and they stimulate our endocrine system, uh, they stimulate the uh, immune system, our glandular system in different ways, the organ system, so that when you have the full spectrum of the rainbow throughout the day, you're stimulating all your glands and organs, and, and for people who are into the more esoteric, the chakra systems, which are directly connected to the glands and organs. And so it's like getting a, a, an energetic massage of all our different systems. And so I find that when we understand that food is constant condensed sunlight, and we're doing the different rays with the different foods, then I think we have a much deeper and uh, a more joyful appreciation of, of the food that we're eating. My first interest in live foods wasn't for health reasons. But in 1975, I had experienced a very steep meditation where I merged into the golden light, and then out of the light came a voice, and it said, you should learn to eat in a way that nourishes the kundalini energy. And the kundalini energy is the um, evolving spiritual energy within all of us. And at that time, I was working with literally thousands of people who were involved in meditation. I had a very unique opportunity, both uh, in the United States and in India, to observe the effect of diet on spiritual life. And I began to explore it. And it took me to, a after I evolved a whole new theory of nutrition, which I explained in Spiritual Nutrition, the Rainbow Diet, that, that the purpose of food is to, to energize our subtle organizing energy fields, which are the matrix of what our physical body comes from. I began to get very clear as I moved from the biophysics to the metaphysics of food that the far superior diet for enhancing spiritual life was indeed a live food diet. Second, not to eat too much. Those are the two principles that got very clear to me. And that's really where I evolved my awareness of, of the rainbow diet aspect of the food and the colors. As it evolved, I began to see that what we were was there, were accumulators of the solar photon energy as it came through the sun, as it came through direct energy, as it came through our food. And many of us suffer from male illumination. Not enough light. Okay. And when we took this light in via the electrons being gathered from the sun through the chlorophyll and then stored in the carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds, and we took that into our cells, that light was released into us and stimulated an inner light. And when we really understand about who we are as beings, we actually give off biophoton energy, which can be measured. And Dr. Pop in Germany measures the biophotons. And when you're really healthy, 
you give off a lot of biophotons. When you're not healthy, hardly any is given off. And his research led to the point of the main way cooked food, basically all the biophoton energy is lost. Irradiated food, all the biophoton is lost. Microwave food, all the biophoton energy is lost. Live food, that's the only way. And the biophoton energy was transferred into macroglobulins, like the hemoglobin and enzymes, which is the main thing we get in a lot of live food. And if you see enzymes as vortexes of energy, they're actually transferring this incredible energy into us. The biophotons are needed for the communication within the cells, from the cell nucleus to the cell membrane, and between cells. And without that, we're kind of losing uh, the way cell intra and, and, and intercellular communication. So this biophoton energy is a direct me measure of how much light we're emanating. Okay, that's some very important principles. So I saw, wait a second, we are accumulators of light. The cleaner our body gets, a certain vortex energy begins to evolve that's running through us. And I do a lot of fasting, and, and this is partly where I picked it up, because fasting is like more intensified life food lifestyle. And I saw myself and saw others as having this vortex of energy, and that the more life foods we do, the more that vortex of energy begins to act as a superconductor of the life force. And as we become more superconductors of the life force, we feel, and of course I come from my own experience first, we can feel that life force, that, that spiritual force moving through us in a way that we can just move into ecstasy on a regular basis, and it actually becomes part of our life. And when you're walking around feeling this incredible life force, this superconductor life force, this ecstasy all the time, you begin to understand that you are a divine being. And the more you feel it, the more you understand it, and the more it becomes part of your consciousness. I call it divine, divine behavior modification. <laughs> and it's true. Because the more you experience your own divinity by feeling the succulent, ecstatic energy of the divine moving through you, the more that just becomes who you are. And you begin seeing and feeling that way. And that way you become more open to the divine experience. You become more open to the sacred, which is there all the time in our life. But you become more open to it because you're feeling it, you're attuned with it, you're being ecstatic with it. Not only do we have enhanced spiritual sensitivity and sensitivity to the sacred in every way, whether it's our sexual life or it's our emotional life or our spiritual life, but actually physically, it, there's just a lot more energy. Uh, when I was uh, 22 and um, captain of an undefeated football team and, and, and inducted into the National Football Hall of Fame and all New England middle linebacker, I could do 70 push-ups. On my 57th birthday, 35 years later, I did 470 push-ups. So I'm getting more limber and more strong with age. And I will continue to do so. I have no question about that. Okay? And that's what's exciting. It works in every level of our being to take us to the full potential of who we can be as human beings. And that's why I'm an advocate of live foods and the live food li lifestyle. And why I call it the lover's electron diet and way of life because you really feel in love with yourself, everybody else, and the whole planet. The reason I so much enjoy teaching live foods and I am an advocate for it and have written about it in my books Spiritual Nutrition, the Rainbow Diet, and Conscious Eating, Depression Free for Life, and why we start a center for it, the Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center, is I see that they're the future wave of how we can heal the biologically altered brain and bring our society back into a healthy state, and how we can, in a sense, create an evolution in our society on a spiritual level so that people can be in touch with the sacred in their life and the sacred in everyone else's life and in that sense be part of the healing and transformation of the whole planet.
name's Gabriel Cousins. I'm a holistic physician. I'm also a uh, licensed homeopathic physician in the state of Arizona. I'm a psychiatrist and family therapist. I also use the modalities of uh, not only homeopathy but Ayurveda and meditation. I've been teaching meditation since 1973, um, as well as natural healing and some elements of Chinese medicine in my overall holistic practice. Um, I'm 57 years old and I've been doing live food since 1983. I wrote my first book on live food, The Spiritual Nutrition in the Rainbow Diet, in 1987. In 1942, divided them in two groups. In one group, he gave totally live foods to, and the other group, he either gave cooked milk or cooked meat to. The cats that were given the live food for the duration of the study were very healthy cats. They had no changes in their mental state as measured by their purring, by consistent behaviors, by their lack of violence and viciousness and, and uh, scratching, biting, and so forth. They gave birth to homogeneous uh, litters. Uh, they didn't have trouble with allergies. They didn't have problems with uh, light, uh, lice and mites and different things like that. And they were generally, consistently very healthy. Okay. The second group who were given the cooked food, in each successive generation there was a breakdown in the quality of health. And that breakdown included um, degeneration. The brains of people are beginning to, in a sense, become biologically altered. Um, and I see it in a, as an epidemic. There's like 40 million people who are depressed. There's 8 million children who are given Ritalin. Up to 10% of the child population now is, is, on, is diagnosed as hyperactive. We have 50 million alcoholics. We have... People are taking in this country five billion tranquilizers a year. As many as 10 million people are taking marijuana each week. 2.2 million people are taking cocaine. Something is out of balance. And instead of saying, oh, it's just kind of a psychosocial problem, I've tried to look deeper into the question. And that question has taken me to the work of Price and Pottinger and their studies uh, where they took... Uh, Dr. Pottinger did a, a 10 year cat study. He had 900 cats, and this is from 1932, approximately. The immune system beginning to go, so the, by, by the third generation, 100% of the cats had allergies. Um, they had mental changes. They, were, uh, they didn't purr anymore, they were violent, they scratched, they bit, their behaviors were irregular. On the physical plane, they actually had a. Um, changing the bone structure in the first generation of these cats they had about 17 percent calcium in the bones by the third generation the bones were like rubber and they had only 1.5 percent calcium it's a big jump the uh, on the physical plane also they had heart disease they had nearsightedness farsightedness malocclusion of the jaw they had physical changes uh, in these areas here palate changes um, they had a significantly weakened immune system. They had uh, consistent infections in the, in the bladder, the kidneys, uh, the adrenals. Um, and my next uh, major book was called Conscious Eating, which just came out. It started in 1990, but also a uh, revised edition with five new chapters having to do with the biologically altered brain, the biologically addicted brain, uh, super nutrition for pregnancy and how to individualize your diet to maximize your vegetarian uh, diet lifestyle. The biologically altered brain I've actually I've mentioned in two of my books. One is called Depression Free for Life and my new edition of Conscious Eating. They complement each other because in terms of live foods but really in a I would say a broader perspective what I see in our society as a psychiatrist, a family therapist, and a holistic physician, is that there's a consistent degeneration that's happening with each generation. And I feel it's uh, the 
because of that 